Welcome back to Operating Systems. In today's lecture, we are going to discuss operating systems for cloud computing. So we've seen this slide before in one of the uh, first lectures of this course when we discussed uh, different configurations of computers that are in use today. And so we've already seen that cloud computing, according to a definition of the US National Institutes of Standards and Technology, has to fulfill a number of properties, like uh, being self-service on demand. So you could actually be enabled as a user of a cloud to just book cloud resources and use them without going through any lengthy sign up and contract process. Uh, it should have high throughput network access because cloud computers are somewhere on the network. And obviously you want them to provide services to a lot of customers, for example, or to your local company. And so you'd have to have a fast connection, no matter where these computers in the cloud are actually located. There needs to be a resource pool. So your cloud systems should be able to adapt to different load requirements. So in times of low load, like when you're selling something and it's, uh, well, slow days over the holidays when everyone's away, then you should be able to reduce the number of servers you use, for example, for your web shop. And when there's a high load, you should be able to increase the number again, depending on the demand. So you have to adapt to these demands relatively quickly. So whenever somebody found out that there is a special offer on your web shop, then you should be able to adapt quickly so you can fulfill all the requests from your customers. So fast activity is another requirement. And finally, of course, you want to figure out how good this service is working that you're well buying or rather renting. So you should be able to measure the performance and uh, any other parameters you're interested in provided by your cloud service. And especially to enable this adaptability of cloud services, we've seen that uh, it would be very useful to have a basic technology that allows us to start up operating systems with applications on demand to shut them down, to move them over to a powerful machine, to move them over to a different location with better network access and so on. So what we want to do is we want to have some sort of separation between the operating system and applications that are running on a system and the hardware itself. So the operating system is no longer in absolutely direct contact with the hardware, but there's a level in between that takes care of, yeah, having another level of indirection, and that's what we call virtualization. And in order to uh, ensure efficient virtualization, we want to virtualize our hardware uh, by uh, creating also multiple virtual machines on one physical computer. So if you have a large physical machine and you have several customers with lower computing demands, you could split up that machine in different virtual machines and rent out each of these parts of these virtual machines to different users. Of course, you could also use such a technology in-house and you've probably used it, for example, to run a Windows system inside of your Linux installation. So each virtual operating system can have its own, uh, each virtual machine can have its own operating system. And this virtualization is an important basic technology especially for cloud computing and server consolidation. And the technical basis for this is a piece of software we call the hypervisor or virtual machine monitor, as we've seen before. And we've also seen there's two different types in general of hypervisors. So a type one hypervisor as shown here on the left-hand side is a hypervisor that like an operating system before would take over complete control of the hardware. So it acts like an operating system running on top of the hardware, and then it provides abstractions that allow a so-called guest OS, so a virtualized operating system, to run on top of it. And that can be a Windows guest OS and in parallel a Linux guest OS. And all applications now run inside of these virtualized operating systems. So you might have whatever Word and Internet Explorer running here in Windows, whereas you might have whatever MX uh, and GCC running in your Linux guest OS as applications. And of course, there can be additional virtual machines and you can usually create them and destroy them on demand. Now a type two hypervisor actually uh, 
tries to make things a bit easier for the person who's writing the hypervisor. So a type 2 hypervisor actually is running on top of a host operating system. So for example, Linux would provide a type 2 hypervisor approach called KVM, the K virtual machine. And then you have applications running on that host operating system. So you can run applications in parallel on your host operating system. And this type 2 hypervisor would then allow you to run more, one or more additional guest OSs, each with its own set of applications. So the difference here is the type 2 hypervisor can make use of services of your host operating system. And in turn, the host operating system is just a regular operating system extended with a hypervisor. And so it could also run its own set of applications in addition to applications running inside of the guest OS. So the question is, how does this work in terms of cloud computing? Now for cloud computing, several different so-called service models have been developed. And these service models differ in uh, terms of uh, what part of this uh, whole hardware and software stack is administered by the cloud service provider, so by the company owning the cloud service, and what part of uh, this stack is administered by you as the customer of this cloud service provider. And here on the right hand side we see a hardware software stack, so we see a sort of network, storage, uh, like disks and so on, and servers. And on top of this, we have software layers like a hypervisor, virtualization layer, an operating system, maybe some sort of middleware and runtime environment. So this might be a database, a Java virtual machine. And of course, we have applications and related data uh, for this. And now we have different service models here. And a service model where you just buy the complete package. So starting from network server storage, going up to uh, applications and data. So you're just using an application. This is called SaaS or software as a service. So here the cloud service provider offers a complete applications and you've probably used applications like these already. This is, for example, Google uh, <coughs> Office Suites, uh, Gmail, uh, Microsoft Office 365, or even Zoom if you run it in a web browser. Now, if you want to retain control of your applications and data here, especially if you provide your own applications, but don't want to be concerned with setting up all the infrastructure like a Java virtual machine, a database, operating systems, and so on, you could also go for a PAS solution, so platform as a service. So this platform as a service provides the execution environments for applications, including the operating system, including the runtime environment, like for example, a Java virtual machine, a database, a web server environment, and so on. So this allows you to concentrate on applications and data, which is your area of expertise, whereas you leave all the remaining system level parts like updating, security fixes, uh, problem fixes, performance optimization of the lower levels, so middleware, runtime, OS, and the hardware itself to whoever is providing this platform as a service. And finally, if you want to retain control also over your runtime environment, middleware and operating system, you could just go and rent a virtual server. So this virtual server includes, of course, storage and network and the service provider for this infrastructure as a service would also provide a virtualization layer. So what you usually rent is just a virtualized server, uh, but uh, there are also companies offering uh, rent for a physical server. So this would mean you could set up virtualization yourself. And there's a, no a large number of uh, offers for this infrastructure as a service model too. And some of the most well-known are Amazon with the EC2 cloud and Microsoft with the Azure cloud. Now, when using cloud services, you might have experienced that sometimes cloud services are simply unavailable. And there are a number of problems actually uh, related to using cloud services. So we've seen a number of advantages. Of course, you reduce the amount of overhead, the reduce of uh, administrative overhead, for example, you have to perform in order to get a system working. So somebody else is paid for this, somebody else takes care of this, but we need to consider problems with cloud computing. And maybe one of the biggest problems is data protection and privacy. So you need to ask yourself, where is my data actually stored or even more important, where is my customer's data actually located physically? So maybe in which country? So uh, are these servers somehow in Norway or in the EU or 
maybe in the US or somewhere else. Uh, and the question is, of course, which data protection laws apply in the respective country. So, for example, uh, in European hosted service, you need to consider the general data protection regulations, GDPR, whereas in the United States, uh, well, certain, uh, for example, uh, official agencies have more access to data and even can demand decryption uh, by the service provider. So essentially, if you want to keep your data safe from, uh, well, uh, noisy people, uh, whoever that might be, uh, then uh, you should really take care of the question where your data is regulated. And of course, you also have to adhere to legal restrictions. So when you offer service to EU customers, then uh, also your cloud service needs to be uh, conformant to GDPR regulations. And of course, the other question is, is a cloud service provider trustworthy? So maybe uh, if you go for the cheapest option, then yeah, you might wonder how this company actually earns money and maybe it earns money by selling your data to whoever might be interested in it. And that might not be in your best interest. Well, so data protection is a really important topic that should not be neglected here, especially when selecting a cloud service provider or uh, when thinking about outsourcing some service to the cloud instead of running it on your internal service. Now, another problem that uh, at first seems to be uh, not that important, but it turns out it can be cr very critical as vendor lock-in. So the big question is, uh, well, you have lots of data on a company's server, and amazingly, uh, you have unlimited amounts of data in your contract for data coming into your servers. Now, the problem is when you want to get the data out of these servers, out of the provider's infrastructure, you have to pay a lot of money. So essentially outgoing data is really, really expensive. So moving your applications and data to a different service provider can be a real problem because it would cost more than continuing with whatever service you have booked before. So, uh, this uh, is really something you need to consider, even if you're running standard Linux virtual machines that could run on any sort of virtualization. The question is, if you have like hundreds of terabytes of data, how many thousands or tens of thousands of dollars would you have to pay to get this data out of the, well, disks of your service provider and onto, well, something else. And the other question is, of course, in which format can you retrieve the data? This is especially important for uh, yeah, platform as a service and uh, software as a service applications. So if you can only retrieve your data in a proprietary format, that's not usable anywhere else. So for example, a Microsoft doc format, which might be difficult to work on in different software as a service uh, provider applications, then that's not ideal. And finally, you need to consider the quality of service. So what uptime is guaranteed by the provider uh, what other guarantees like network bandwidth uh, and, and so on uh, does your provider guarantee. And don't let, uh, don't be fooled by, by high numbers uh, given by the cloud providers. So like we have a 99% availability, sounds good at first, until you start thinking about that 99% availability means the service might fail for 1% and this means about three and a half days per year. And that might discourage your customers from using your service because that can get very frustrating. So, for example, availability should be like uh, in the five or six, what we call Sigma rates so 99.99 or 999%. That would be much more acceptable, but obviously you pay much more for redundant, uh, redundancy, for availability of redundant power supplies and disks and whatsoever uh, when you want higher availability. And as you've seen, even that sometimes doesn't help. So just last week, uh, it was in the news that this data center somewhere uh, in, in France actually burned down completely. And so many, many terabytes of customer data were actually lost uh, because there were no reliable backup systems available uh, for, from that company. Now to realize cloud services, you have a number of different provisioning models. So the first provisioning model is what is, for example, offered by Amazon EC2 or Microsoft Azure, which is a public cloud. So in a public cloud, your cloud service provider or CSP has arbitrary customers. So you have a huge compute center with lots of computers and actually these computers or parts of the computers in a virtual machine are rented out to whichever customer asks for it. 
On the other hand, you can have a private cloud. So a private cloud is a cloud infrastructure for a company, usually a large company. And this can either use the company's own resources. You have your cloud on-premises somewhere, which is more or less your traditional compute center, but maybe enhanced with cloud computing abilities like virtual machine management. Or you can rent cloud resources, but you have a guarantee by your cloud service provider that all these resources are exclusively used by you or your company. So this enables you to have more control. So inside of that specific cloud are only applications and data that you want to use or administer. Then there's the community cloud. So uh, this uh, doesn't include arbitrary customers. But this includes uh, customers having the same requirement that share a one cloud infrastructure here. Maybe customers that work together or so on. And of course, there can be mixed approaches, so hybrid clouds, where you outsource some of the functionality, which is maybe less critical to a public cloud, and run some other functionality on your in-house cloud solution. So uh, we can compare different provisioning models according to Stallings. Uh, there's a table in his operating systems book. And so we see that there's uh, different criteria we can uh, actually use to assess our cloud solutions. So like scalability, data protection and security, performance, reliability, and of course costs. And we see for a private cloud, well, the scalability is maybe restricted, especially if you do it on promise premises, you have only have so much space and electricity available for hosting servers and maybe also so much money only available for buying more servers. So scalability is restricted, but you have full control over it. So this is the most secure option regarding data protection and security. You can have a very good performance, especially if you have your private cloud in-house, because then you could just have very fast internet connections. This can have a very high reliability well, obviously, depending on the hardware you buy and the people administering it. But of course, it's very costly because you have to buy all this stuff in advance before you can use it. A community cloud is restricted at scalability. It can be very secure if you know the others uh, who are part of your community. It can have a very good performance and very high reliability because usually when you do changes in such a community cloud, you first communicate with all the other people in your community if these changes would be appropriate. Uh, the costs are a bit lower because you can share some of the infrastructure like, uh, well, basic servers, this uh, rent for a server room or your basic network connection. Well, a public cloud has very high scalability because you can just buy more and more stuff from Amazon. And if this is not enough, you go to a different cloud service provider. But of course, data protection and security are at best moderately secure. Performance can be low to medium. Well, depending on how much you're willing to pay, I'm afraid. Uh, reliability is also medium. This obviously depends on your cloud service provider, but it's comparatively low cost and especially scalable since you can just reduce the requirements on demand. So you can run servers for, well, just single hours, for example, or single days, depending on the configuration of servers, instead of renting them for a month or a year, and then maybe not using them half of the time. And of course, the hybrid cloud gives you a mix of all these different uh, properties here. So here we have an uh, example for an application setup and the required requirements here. So on the left hand side, we see our cloud service consumers or CSC, and they first need to access the cloud service provider using, for example, a web portal. And this web portal is used to actually sign virtually probably a contract, which includes so-called service level agreement, which gives information about the number of CPUs and memory and disk space and network bandwidths you have available at least and maybe even additional costs when you require more than this. So you start off with a secure access wire portal. You can select the functions you require from your web service provider. So for example, you can select, I want a Linux virtual machine or a Windows virtual machine, or you can select, I want a complete web service solution, which is scalable up to whatever so many network connections. So you're choosing a service and 
in this web service portal, you can also observe your virtual machine. So you can check the health status, the network connections, the throughput, and you can also adapt this on demand. So this is usually a web interface that allows you to configure all the services you are renting from your cloud service provider. So this provisioning of the required resources here is then configured uh, after you actually agree to the service level agreement on the web portal and probably paid for your services. And this then gets part of your service, gets part of the disks and network bandwidth share of your cloud service provider. So all of this is usually virtualized here and pooled together. So you have pools of network connections, you have pools of disks and pools of compute resources, and you get a small share of these virtualized according to how much money you paid. So the cloud service provider then provides the required resources here and confirms the service level agreement and obviously also the uh, related costs. And then you can deploy your solution depending on whatever you uh, actually rented here. So you can deploy your maybe Linux systems on virtual machines here, or you can just deploy your application on a complete solution that also provides middleware and databases. And then finally, you can obviously use your cloud service or other people can use your cloud service, for example, if it's a web shop. And uh, you, as the uh, person who rents this web service, can observe the service, you can manage it, you can migrate it, you can change the redundancy, you can maybe check for energy optimization, you can extend your cloud services if you, for example, need more disk space, and so on and so forth. So essentially, a cloud service provider just operates one or more large compute centers, which offer just pools of CPUs, so racks of service, and then other racks just of storage service and disks, and, well, a large number of uh, pretty thick network connections. And then it just chops this up into little pieces, which you can then rent for hours or months or whatever you do require. So when we talk about operating systems, of course, we want to know what the general architecture of such a operating system for cloud computing is. And we've seen that in cloud computing, all resources are virtualized. So no matter if you uh, book a platform as a service, a software as a service, or just the infrastructure as a service, this infrastructure as a service, so virtualization, is the basis for all services that are constructed upon this. So on the bottom, we have our physical infrastructure, as we've seen before. So just standard service uh, mounted in such 19-inch racks, standard mass storage, which can be directly attached storage, so just disks inside of your REC uh, enclosure here. So inside of your 19-inch enclosure, maybe there's a couple of SSDs or disks. Or you can have network attached storage, which means there's a separate disk somewhere uh, connected over, uh, for example, Ethernet or different network connections. Or you can also have the storage virtualized over a so-called storage area network or SAN, which means that it's also a service available over the internal network of your cloud service provider. And then you have, well, standard, but of course, high performance network switches to connect all the service in the compute center of your cloud service provider together. And of course, to the, to the internet. Now, all of this is virtualized using a hypervisor. So uh, it provides virtual machines and inside of these virtual machines, uh, you have functionality for server administration, so administering virtual CPUs, memories, accelerators like GPUs, and all sorts of storage. Another part of the cloud operating system is that storage management itself, so uh, keeping images of your virtual machines, so disk images uh, somewhere safe, providing backups and snapshots, and also private storage for virtual machines. You have network management, so you can reserve a certain bandwidth of your network. You can have virtual networks to enable, for example, VPN connections to your in-house solutions. And you have address management. So, for example, you can book additional IPv4, IPv6 addresses according to your requirements. And you can have on top of this things like databases or object storage. So the simplest thing is block-based memory. So uh, block-based storage would, would just be... Uh, yeah, uh, essentially disks. You can have file-based storage like uh, network file systems uh, for Windows or Unix-based applications, so SMB or NFS. Or you can also have something like object storage. So this would be sort of a distributed key value store, uh, which is a sort of a primitive database, which could also be provided. And finally, you should have management and orchestration 
that links all the functionality together that can control starting up, shutting down of virtual machines and also provides methods controlling the authorization. So who has access to administrative functions and user functions of your uh, well cloud operating system. So you see, this is not a traditional view of an operating system because it includes much more, but in general, functionality can be mapped to functionality of an operating system as we've seen it. And then on top of it, you have application programming interfaces and also graphical user interfaces very often provided by uh, web services nowadays uh, to enable your applications to run on this. So when you configure a cloud service, you have to take a number of strategic decisions here, like where to place the VMs, when should they be migrated? So in, if we uh, anticipate a certain load, should we migrate them in advance? Should we only migrate them when the load is over a certain limit? How can we minimize our service level agreement violations? So what happens if we use more network bandwidth than we are paying for? How much overbooking on the other hand takes place uh, uh, at the uh, service provider side? So very often you'd actually sell more capacity than you actually have physically available because the probability that all your customers use their maximum uh, service level agreement uh, capabilities at the same time is very low. So uh, this also happens maybe from a real life example for flights where regularly flights are overbooked because uh, airlines know that not all customers arrive for their flight. So they're selling a few more seats than is actually available on the plane and then uh, they get a lot of trouble if actually all the customers show up. And the question is, of course, does it make sense and when does it make sense to release and switch off single computers? So essentially, um, for example, if you pay for energy in addition, then shutting off a complete computer might even save you some money here. And here's just a table from a German PhD thesis here. We're not going into much details on the strategies here, but this shows you that you can actually have quite different setups, which leads to different costs, different penalties you have to pay uh, in terms of violating service level agreements. So uh, renting different amounts of CPU, memory, and so on. And then uh, how much money you actually have to pay in addition, or how much money you can earn, depending on which service level agreement you have. So this is essentially a multi-criterial optimization problem. So setting up cloud services is an interesting application, maybe even of economical uh, approaches to provisioning such a complex distributed uh, system on a cloud. So as one example for an open source cloud operating system, we have uh, the structure of OpenStack here. So OpenStack consists of a number of components. So we have web front ends to uh, access OpenStack. But of course, if you have to set up like hundreds of virtual machines, you not, don't want to just click through a hundred of web pages to configure all of your virtual machines. So you also have some API access that allows you to programmatically create and destroy and change the properties of virtual machines. And you can use these here, uh, for example, using a Python SDK or a special client as the user of the OpenStack system. And then you have provisionings here uh, of different levels. You have uh, application lifecycle management that consider, for example, things like uh, updating applications and so on. You have orchestrations, so actually to uh, yeah, to control the interplay of your services and applications. Then you have a component just uh, considering the compute resources you have available. And below that you have networking. You also have hardware lifecycle management. So when you run a service for many years, there should be a hardware upgrade every now and then just because, well, your disks uh, are old or maybe your fans in your computer need replacement or just general cleaning or stuff like that. And uh, of course, you also have storage management here for different storage solutions. And uh, on base, uh, based on that, you can do lifecycle management for OpenStack. Um, so you can manage deployment of services and uh, also uh, just adding packages, for example, using containers or using Linux package management. Now, on the other hand, you can do observation and monitoring here. So you have like uh, different metering observations to actually figure out what your cloud system is doing at the moment. You can have several optimization tools here. And of course, you can have a billing tool that allows you to, if you're the cloud service provider, to bill your customers 
And finally, uh, there's uh, additional components like container services uh, that you can add to the system in order to extend its capabilities. So you see, this is a really complex pro uh, system already. Uh, but in general, it has all the components that we've already known from an operating system. So we do some scheduling, some networking, some management, uh, some management of uh, like uh, yeah, uh, storage uh, and and also upgrades and all the other stuff that you would need to do with a regular operating system too. But of course, this is an order of magnitude larger than just a regular single machine operating system. So how does virtualization come into play here? Now, virtualization is used to enforce the strict adherence of your cloud service uh, structure to a layer structure through the control and intervention possibilities that are available for resource accesses by a VM. So, identically to an operating system restricting access to the hardware from applications, the virtual machine now can actually restrict direct hardware accesses, so resource use, from the operating system running on top of it to the hardware because it can intercept them and can decide when to schedule certain operations of the operating system, where to put certain blocks of disks and how to limit network throughput. And all these functionalities are the basis for multiplexing. So you have virtualization, for example, uh, to provide virtual memory. So we have one kind of resource here. So you have just a single physical memory and you would split this up into three sections for three virtual machines and each of these gets a share of this virtual memory. Or you can do aggregation, which means you might have multiple disks here, which are visible as a single disk. We've seen this in a previous lecture uh, concerning RAID systems, for example. Or you can have a one-to-one -one virtualization here where you actually uh, and that's the difference, provides something completely different here. So with multiplexing and aggregation, actually we provide the same sort of resource on top as is on the bottom. So either we multiplex it or we aggregate it. And with emulation, we provide a different kind of resource. So for example, we would run a NES emulator to play the nice old games from the 1980s. And this would mean if we don't have a real NES, uh, we would run an NES emulator on our PC here, Platform X, and then by virtualization make this appear as a different platform that's able to execute your NES games. And this construction principle, we've seen this before, like virtual memory on operating system level, virtualization for disks on RAID level. We've seen this can be replicated on different layers. So on the device driver layer, on the OS layer, on the hypervisor layer, or even in hardware itself, and for a large number of different resources like CPUs, memory, or external storage. So one special use case of virtualization you've maybe used before is container-based virtualization or simply containers. So one of the most well-known container platforms nowadays is probably Docker. And maybe you've used Docker containers before and uh, Docker and other container solutions like uh, uh, Jails on FreeBSD, uh, for example, uh, they just virtualize the operating system kernel. So this means that a container is just a set of application processes running on your one and only operating system kernel on a machine. So your containers share one kernel and then it can have different system processes. It can have a different view of your file system and different libraries. So here you have an operating system S and this operating system S is actually provided without any additional software to your containers. But this virtualization layer is just a very shallow layer that actually controls which of the features of this underlying operating system S are actually made available to the containers. So maybe this container might only be able to see two of your 10 CPUs, or this container might only be able to see a part of your file system here. And inside of these containers, you would run regular applications that are exactly identical to the operating system applications that you can run natively on the, uh, on the operating system without any virtualization. So containers are used very often to provide something like a shrink-wrapped solution, where all of your library dependencies, configuration files, databases, application software for a certain application is just packed into a single container image that you can download then, and you can, without installing it somewhere, execute it 
safely and securely on your computer. So your container virtualization component like Docker takes care of providing separate views to the separate containers. So maybe container one can't see the files of container two and the other way around, and they can only see a very restricted subset of the overall files available in all the file systems of our underlying operating system. Uh, it has to provide resource partitioning, for example, uh, CPU allocation or CPU time allocation, and memory allocation. And it should also provide efficient sharing. So for example, if you have two containers here, including a large number of identical shared libraries, so these would be, for example, two Debian Linux distributions of the same version here, uh, then of course you would only need one copy of all the shared libraries for your containers instead of delivering them separately with each container. So our container docking uh, virtualization uh, solution should uh, be enabled uh, to provide efficient sharing approaches uh, like, uh, for example, file deprecation avoidance. And one example for this is Linux container support. So uh, the container support, well, is actually more or less integrated in the Linux kernel. Or to say it more precisely, uh, container solutions like Docker actually only app use functionality provided by the Linux kernel to actually partition applications. So very early on in Linux or Unix, way before Linux, you had a capability called a change root or ch root environment where you could start a process and only make a certain subtree of your file or directory tree available to these applications. So this would mean that this application would not be allowed to read or write data outside of its assigned directory tree and essentially would be constrained to these number of files but it still could, for example, access as many CPU or main memory resources as it wanted. So this was only a very simple and trivial containerization only for storage. But more modern storage solutions provide uh, additional things like namespaces for tasks. So Linux virtualization support for containers uh, can provide uh, processes running inside of container, separate names for computers, separate spaces for process IDs, separate mount points so a container can mount its own file systems again, separate network devices and separate network configurations. So for example, containers get a share of the bandwidth, which is guaranteed to be not higher than uh, something we configured. It can have its own IPC objects, control groups, and it can also provide its own system time. So this is all made to create the uh, illusion for processes running inside of a container that they're just running on a separate uh, operating system on the, of their own. So this creating of an illusion again, as we've seen as a general principle in operating systems design. And to do resource partitioning like CPU, memory, uh, disk space, uh, the virtualization solutions use this basic Linux technology we call control groups or just C groups. And so containers share uh, CPU time, memory, and I.O. bandwidth, and how much this is that can actually be configured by the administrator of the container solution. And for this, you have a configuration interface. And since this is Unix, we are trying to uh, present everything in form of a file system. So that's yet another pseudo file system, as we've seen with a proc file system before. And this is called cgroupfs. And, uh, one solution uh, that's very interesting if we want to efficiently share files. So if you want to have a, a common basis like shared libraries for a number of different containers, uh, this is enabled by a so-called overlay file system. So this means you have a sort of a lower file system, which is read only, which for example, provides a rudimentary Debian Linux distribution with uh, whatever system programs like bin ls uh, and shared libraries like your libc. And on top of this, you mount a file system that can either overlay or replace uh, any file in the original file system without changing it really. So it's just a different view again. So we have one file system that lies on top of another file system and this file system on top can have additional files or can make changes to files which are on the underlying file system, but any unchanged file is just passed through unmodified, which means that we can save storage space. If we have a hundred containers with only minimal changes in the upper file system, they can all share 
a one and single basic Linux distribution, for example, below. So you're overlaying directory trees. This is a functionality which has been available in Linux early on with a very uh, yeah exotic Linux distribution nowadays, which is no longer existing, called Yggdrasil Linux, uh, which provided this. So you were enabled to boot from a CD-ROM, which is obviously unchangeable, and then still be able to change files in this CD-ROM file system. That was very convenient. But this principle was uh, already adapted from a research operating system by uh, Bell Labs, who also invented Unix. So after Unix, the original Unix creators uh, built a an operating system called Plan 9 and Plan 9 actually built on this overlay file system to the extreme. So it just booted from a RAM disk file system and then you overlaid all the directory trees you needed on top with different so-called bindings. So this takes the idea of yeah, having everything as a file in your system to an extreme and that works actually extremely well. So in order to provide efficient cloud services, uh, instead of running containers, which can be efficient, but which don't provide perfect isolation. So for example, you need to uh, run the same kernel version and the same operating system in turn for all of your containers running on top of your containerized virtualization solution. And, and if you want more flexibility, you need hardware virtualization. And as we've seen before in the initial slide, hardware virtualization doesn't virtualize only the kernel but it virtualizes a complete computer, including a CPU, memory, and IO devices. And we've seen we can have two types of hypervisors. So we can have this type one hypervisor, which is a hypervisor software, like an operating system running directly on top of a certain hardware X. And this provides several partitions of this hardware, including CPU, memory, IO devices as a separate virtual machine. And on this virtual machine, you can install any guest OS that would run on the original hardware X here. And this can run any of its own applications. And one of these virtual machines can also include management of the hypervisor. And of course, you can run a separate virtual machine with a different maybe operating system or the same uh, guest OS as uh, VM1 also able to run on that hardware platform. So this would not allow you to, for example, run an x86 operating system on base of uh, ARM hardware. That's what many people who bought the new uh, ARM-based Macs currently want. So this is not possible because you virtualize the CPU, which means you just give out CPU shares, which still, of course, execute the same instruction set as before. Uh, so this would require additional functionality here. Um, and you can have these type two hypervisors here. As we've seen, they work on top of a host operating system. So uh, they can make use of services of this host operating system, which can also have its own applications and its uh, own management here. And then uh, on top of this, we can also run operating systems made for this special hardware platform X. So again, maybe a Linux or a Windows guest OS for x86 if we have an x86 platform as the original hardware here. But now the virtualization, uh, the virtualization's task is easier because it can rely on services of the underlying operating system, like providing file systems or memory management uh, to do its tasks. So this is a type two hypervisor. So in order to get a better understanding of virtualization, we need to uh, consider the separate parts we are virtualizing, separate parts of our computer. And the, one of the most important parts is obviously the CPU. And the most simple approach to virtualize the CPU is just to write a program that actually reads whatever you're going to execute in your virtual machine, instruction for instruction. So it starts at the first instruction, for example, of your virtualized operating system kernel, and then either interprets it. So there's a large table, usually a jump table, that decodes your hexadecimal opcode and then decides whatever, if it's opcode X, then it's a load instruction and then it implements a load from maybe a large array in memory that represents the virtual memory of your guest machine. And if it's a different instruction, maybe it's a jump instruction, then it just changes state to wherever your, your instructions for your virtual machine are located and then continues interpreting from that location. Now, as you can imagine, this is pretty slow. Uh, 
So uh, an approach to actually increase speed here is to use just-in-time translation. So just-in-time translation would actually uh, take blocks of these co this code where we figure out we are going to execute it multiple times because it's a commonly used function or maybe uh, the uh, loop body of a, a loop that's executed multiple times. And so we can do a compilation essentially from the binary code for one machine to maybe the binary code of another machine. That's what Apple is doing in part with the emulation for x86 code for the old Macs to ARM code for the new Macs. And they've done it before with the previous transition 15 years ago when they transitioned from PowerPC to Intel. And just-in-time translation is also happening for virtual instruction sets. So for example, just-in-time translation is used for the Java virtual machine and also for your JavaScript executing in your web browser. And because it's only once translated to native code instead of always interpreting it, then all subsequent uh, iterations of executing that piece of code are faster because then it's available in native code. And there's a number of examples, of course, for these uh, virtualizations uh, made by emulation. So an x86 emulator that's interpreting is called Box. And there's several uh, just-in-time translating systems like QMU, which can emulate a large number of systems. And also MAME, for example, for emulating a large number of game consoles and arcade games and so on. The advantage of using CPU emulation is that you can imitate, imitate an arbitrary CPU with the help of the CPU that's in your machine. So you can run x86 code on your ARM or you can run 6502 code for a Nintendo NES uh, on your x86 PC. And uh, on top of this, you can of course also emulate operating system requirements and so on. Now, the biggest problem is that this is very slow. So depending on the method you use and how well your emulation was implemented, you get a slowdown of one or several orders of magnitude. So, for example, we have this piece of code here, which just, well, goes through a loop, calls a function and uh, adds something to it and stops the timer. When we execute this, uh, well, uh, with and without code optimization here, so when we switch on or off optimization in our compiler, uh, well, <clears throat> for a native execution, it takes about a quarter of a second here. Uh, when we run it in an old QMU version, uh, well, it takes around uh, 10.5 seconds here and the optimization actually makes it uh, a bit faster uh, compared to the 12 seconds without optimization here. In an old box version, it took 25 seconds, so even slower here, or 31 without optimization. A more recent box version was uh, three times faster, so I assume they added some sort of JIT compiler here. And of course, the recent QMU version would uh, be even faster here. So these numbers are relatively old. Now, what does this tell us? A slowdown of a factor like uh, 10 to 40 is uh, probably pretty un uh, unacceptable. So uh, if it's possible, you should avoid CPU emulation. But of course, if you have to use a different CPU, then uh, there's no other way to do it. Well, there is actually one other way to do it, and that's what, for example, Apple does nowadays in the transition to ARM-based Macintoshes. And that's they're doing a head-of-time compilation. So essentially, they're statically compiling as much of the binary x86 program as they can. And they're storing this uh, to uh, just refer to this already translated code. So whatever they can translate statically, uh, at the first execution of the program, they keep just a memory of this and then whatever needs to be executed at runtime because maybe your program is loading additional components at runtime, which are unpredictable. This is then just in time translated and that can give very uh, efficient execution speeds even for the emulated code so that you actually don't recognize because of a speed down that this code is not executing native machine instructions originally. So a more efficient approach for CPU virtualization is the multiplexing of CPUs. So you have one CPU X or set of CPUs and you provide identically well looking CPUs to your virtual uh, machines that have the same instruction set uh, as your basic CPU. You're really executing your code on. And uh, in order to enable this, we need a number of properties or virtualization criteria here. First, we need equivalence. So we want to run our operating system unchanged from running it on real hardware. 
So we need equivalence. This means a virtual machine needs to behave identical to the real machine. Then we need security. So a VM must be isolated. So it should not be uh, able to access memory or data of other VMs or of the hypervisor. It should not be able to use more resources than it was allocated. And in turn, the hypervisor needs to have full control over our virtual machine. And of course, it needs to be performance. So our virtual CPUs should not be significantly slower than the real CPU. Now, not all processor architectures are virtualizable in this way. And this was already found out in 1974 by Popek and Goldberg, who also, uh, well, designed the very first virtualization criteria and designed parts of the IBM VM virtualization software here. And they found out that CPUs have so-called sensitive instructions, which depend on the privileged mode of the CPU. We've already seen, for example, that an instruction to disable interrupts is not available in user mode because then a user mode application would be able to disable timer interrupts so no scheduling would take place uh, after, after that. And uh, since now this instruction needs to run in kernel mode, we have a problem because our virtualized operating system is no longer allowed to run in kernel mode now because our hypervisor needs to uh, retain control of the hardware. So our hypervisor runs in kernel mode, which means our kernel, together with its application, now runs in user mode. But our kernel still contains, because it's unchanged, for example, an instruction to disable interrupts. And this in turn means that this instruction will fail because it's now executed still in the kernel, but the kernel is running in user mode, which doesn't allow this. So if uh, the, so the question is what really happens if the kernel would try to execute such a uh, disable interrupt instruction. And there's two ways. The first way is there are CPUs which just ignore this instruction. And this is problematic because there was a reason why this kernel had disabled interrupts, for example, to do some sort of synchronization. And if we wouldn't be able to intercept this, then, well, our kernel semantic would be different. So uh, it would probably do a wrong thing. So essentially what needs to happen is that all of these sensitive instructions here, which now run in user mode in our virtualized kernel, need to actually be intercepted. So they create a trap and this trap actually calls a function in our hypervisor. Our hypervisor can then analyze which sensitive instruction was actually just attempted to be executed by our virtualized kernel and then can try to emulate it. So uh, another uh, example for this would, of course, be a syscall instruction. So it's an instruction that changes the mode uh, to uh, essentially a privileged mode. So if a user mode application executes syscall, it would now end up in the hypervisor. So our hypervisor has to relay this to our kernel running in user mode. So uh, the emulator, the emulation functionality of the hypervisor now does not include whole CPU emulation because we're just providing the same CPU, but only a subset of the CPU which is concerned with these sensitive instructions which have to be intercepted. And then the hypervisor has to decide what to do. And the rest of the CPU virtualization actually works like a regular OS. So instead of scheduling processes, now it schedules VMs and the processes inside of these VMs are scheduled by the virtualized kernel they're running on. So the next component of our computer we have to virtualize is memory. So our virtualized operating system kernel now running in user mode assumes it has full control of the hardware because we don't want to change its code. So it's not aware of running on top of a hypervisor. So our guest operating system assumes that it has complete control over the hardware. And in turn, it means that, for example, the memory allocation in our guest operating system kernel just uses arbitrary physical page frames. And of course, if you have several virtual machines and a hypervisor running in parallel, then you might have conflicts between the page frame, so the physical page in memory that was selected to store data if two guest VMs actually decide to use the same physical page frame. So there's no way to coordinate this within the guest operating system kernels, just because they don't know of each other. So essentially we have to provide a layer in between to provide some sort of virtual virtual memory for this. So our hardware provides physical memory and this is available to our hypervisor, which then can map parts of this physical memory 
to a virtualized hardware. So this would mean that our hypervisor has to use memory virtualization technology, so virtual memory and the MMU, to provide our guest with its illusion of physical memory, which is already virtualized because we need to intercept accesses. And then our guest actually would then assume that these virtualized pages are actually its own physical pages and then provide another level, namely its own virtual memory management, on top of that. So this creates an additional memory mapping layer. And as you can imagine, this results in quite a bit of overhead. So how can we implement this additional memory virtualization layer? So the first solution that doesn't require any special hardware support is to uh, implement shadow page tables. So the idea is actually to just ignore the page tables the guest OS creates and have our hypervisor here keep a shadow page table for each of the page tables of the guests. So the guest page tables actually just point to entries in our shadow page tables, which then a point in turn to physical memory pages. This means that whenever uh, our guest OS is doing changes to its own page tables, that these accesses in turn must be intercepted and interpreted and then appropriately modified the hypervisor shadow page tables here. Or the other version is to ignore all the changes and just wait for a page fault and then update pages on demand. Now, both variants results in many traps to the hypervisor. Uh, so first, when the operating system changes its own page tables and we intercept the changes of the guest OS page tables here, each of these successes has to be intercepted, has to be interpreted, and has to be changed into appropriate shadow page table entries here. Or, uh, uh, and then afterwards, we get no page faults for all the map pages here. Or if we just ignore this and wait for page faults here, then in turn, well, uh, every page fault that occurs has uh, incurs this overhead here to update the pages on demand. No matter what you do, shadow page tables are expensive, but they're the only way you can use when you don't have any special hardware virtualization support. Uh, so to lower the costs, there's two different approaches. First, you can have hardware support. We'll discuss this in a moment. Or you can use something we call para virtualization, which we'll discuss afterwards. So providing hardware support makes it easier to actually efficiently uh, virtualize your system. And this solution that's provided uh, is called nested page tables by AMD. Intel calls it extended page tables. No matter what, it's the same functionality. And the idea now is to have the hardware be responsible for the complete memory management. So not only of your hypervisor, but also of the guest operating system. So each guest OS can change its page table as required. So the page table is created by it. But this means you have a, well, increased uh, complexity of your page tables because now you have to walk through when you have a page miss, for example, a TLB miss, for example, uh, so a page fault. So you have to walk through different layers of your page table until you finally reach the physical page table entry of that nested page table here that's then really relevant for your guest OS. So you have to walk through all your hypervisor mappings first until you arrive at your guest OS page mappings and then you can finally update the TLB entry in the virtualized CPU for your guest OS. So your page tables now have a more complex tree structures here, pointers to tables of physical guest addresses and the translation to physical addresses is then required. And in this example here, we would need four translations here indicated by these red arrows until we arrive at the page we want. Still, this is more efficient because this is done in hardware compared to keeping a track of, page, of shadow page tables in software in the hypervisor. Now there's a number of additional approaches for memory virtualization and we'll just sh uh, quickly uh, mention them. So. There's uh, an approach called ballooning. So this is a trick for dynamic allocation of memory to VMs, which means that there's a small driver module inside of the VM that communicates with the hypervisor. So you have to install some uh, hypervisor extensions in your guest OS. You've maybe seen this already with, if you've used VMware or VirtualBox before, that there's VirtualBox or VMware extensions you can install in common operating systems like Linux or, or Windows. 
writing as a guest OS, and this can reserve memory of the OS kernel on demand. So we don't need a fixed allocation, uh, which would reduce the uh, number of VMs maybe you can run in parallel. And this memory then can be distributed to other VMs if we don't need this uh, memory anymore as the VM we're currently running. We can also have deduplication, so we can detect and avoid duplicate memory page contents. So for example, if we run a large number of Linux systems virtualized on one machine, on one hypervisor, we could try to, for example, deduplicate all the text pages of our shared libraries like libc, because if they're just the absolutely identical version, so absolutely byte for byte identical in a page. This would require you to scan the pages, for example, to create a hash value over them, and then create identical virtual page mappings to one and only physical page for all the different VMs. This obviously saves main memory when we have the case of virtualizing just maybe a hundred Debian systems with the identical distribution. You can also have VM migrations, so you can migrate, so copy or move the complete memory contents of a virtual machine to another host system in case you're running out of memory or your system fails. And this can be optimized, so you don't have to transfer the whole large, maybe four gigabyte address space of your virtual machine in one uh, just single transaction. This would take a lot of time and your services would be unavailable during this migration, but you can do this on demand. So you can transfer pages while the VM is running using the standard page fault mechanism of your operating system. So whenever uh, you start to migrate an operating system to a different machine, it starts generating page faults. These pages are not available on the new machine. So you fetch them from the old machine on demand, which is a really nice trick. And this just uses the dirty bit and the page table to uh, monitor recent changes. And you can also do VM replication. So uh, this means you would uh, periodically transfer the state changes of the memory of your VM to a different VM, maybe on a different machine. So this means when, for example, the hardware of your first machine fails, then you have a complete snapshot of the state of that machine and you can just continue switching over uh, the network connection maybe to that new machine and continue running as before. And finally, the third component of our computer we have to virtualize is I.O. So as with CPU emulation, we can use a simple approach to emulate and multiplex I.O. devices. So I.O. devices are usually controlled either by memory mapped accesses, uh, addresses. So this means a, a range of your physical memory addresses is not baked by real RAM, but we have a mapping of registers. So just uh, control structures for your I.O. devices uh, available at that address here, or they can be accessed, for example, on uh, x86 using special instructions. For example, there are special I.O. instructions uh, available on the PC to access a number of devices. And both the uh, ranges of I.O. device registered mapped in memory and these special instructions uh, that access essentially uh, these uh, I.O. registers in a special address space, they can be intercepted by the hypervisor. Uh, so either using the MMU, which means when we try to access this address range of our uh, physical I.O. devices, then we'll get a trap to the hypervisor or a trap because such an input output special instruction is not allowed in user mode. So this mode is called trap and emulate. So whenever something is attempted by the guest operating system that's not allowed in user mode, then again, like with CPU emulation, we end up in the hypervisor and the hypervisor then has to figure out what was attempted by the operating system kernel and then has to provide an emulation of this IO device. Now this allows us to emulate arbitrary IO devices using a different IO device. So we could emulate a SCSI hard disk, for example, on top of a system, just providing an IDE hard disk. And this uh, actually is used for very many devices. For example, in VirtualBox, we have PS2 mouse keyboard emulation. Even if we run USB mouse and keyboard, we have uh, very many different sorts of hard disks, different graphic cards, different network cards, uh, different host controllers, uh, sound cards, and so on. And no matter, no matter what your actual host uses, so you don't need to use an operating system that is configured for exactly the same set of devices in your host PC, but you can rely on a specific set of virtual devices you can configure in your web setup. So you can say, I want this network card or another one, or I want this hard disk interface or this graphics card. 
Now the problem like with CPU emulation is this is slow. So the I.O. throughput achievable here is a problem because even simple I.O. operations on devices like hard disk accesses may require hundreds or even a thousand uh, I.O. register accesses. So I.O. emulation is expensive and again we can achieve lower costs by providing hardware support or using para virtualization. Now, of course, we want faster alternatives. So one alternative here is not to use multiplexing, but to provide device path through. So this means that one device is exclusively aligned, uh, assigned to exactly one VM. So for example, uh, you have a couple of VMs and one VM may exclusively use your graphics card, which means all the others are not allowed to use the graphics card. So this would be PCIe, for example, path through for a GPU. Uh, so this is done using memory mapping again, for example, for memory and I.O. registers, and this would allow for arbitrary register accesses because this, well, component like the GPU is now no longer shared between VMs, but it's exclusively assigned to one. And so, in turn, it doesn't cause a trap. Now, the problem is if the, such a device tries to do direct memory accesses because direct memory addresses are physical host addresses. So, if a uh, guest operating system would try to configure, for example, a specific disk interface controller card to use DMA, then it would use the incorrect addresses because this disk controller would write to real physical memory instead of the view of physical memory our virtual machine has. And that would mess up uh, your memory contents. Uh, it would could be used for uh, well, essentially attacks to your system to violate VM isolations. And it could also cause interrupts to be triggered on the wrong CPU because also your CPU is virtualized. One solution for this is to provide a memory management unit also for IO memory accesses. So this again is a hardware extension that's implemented either in your CPU or your memory of chipset. And so your DMA like your CPU now also uses an address mapping using tables which is in turn accelerated using a separate TLB from your main CPU TLB. And you can also use interrupt remapping. So uh, this ensures that the interrupts freely end up in the correct virtual machine and not in a completely different virtual machine, which would be surprised because it never requested an operation that could cause the interrupt that just arrived. Another hardware supported approach for IO virtualization is PCIe single root IO virtualization. This is a hardware mechanism that allows one device to appear as multiple virtual devices. So it provides multiple IO register sets, multiple IO interrupt configurations, and so on. And then the hypervisor uh, can map one of these virtualized devices to a virtual machine, and it doesn't have to interfere any longer because it's exclus exclusively mapped. But this also comes with a set of problems like the hardware uh, which actually takes care of the prioritization of accesses by the VM itself. For example, it can do round robin, even though the hypervisor decided, for example, for uh, the sake of throughput to prioritize accesses to a virtual device to one of the virtual machines and the others would have to wait if the hardware decides otherwise. Well, then you have a conflict here, which might uh, lead to, for example, performance degradation or uh, unwanted interferences. So cloud operating systems we've seen are very much based on virtualization technologies and virtualization is an important architectural concept and that's recurring all over our system software stack. And if we do this transparent, we can do multiplexing, aggregation and emulation. And to uh, do this efficiently, we need hardware virtualization support. And uh, this replaces the inflexible connection of hardware and software if we run the OS directly on top of the hardware. And this enables additional features uh, such as migration and replication of VMs at runtime, which can in turn uh, significantly increase your availability of your system or your performance. And this hardware virtualization is the technical basis for cloud computing. So x86 CPUs originally didn't even fulfill the original 1974 Popek and Goldberg requirements for virtualization. Uh, and all of this was subsequently fixed by Intel and AMD uh, in order to be able to sell lots of processors to cloud service providers. And the operating systems for clouds have, uh, well, essentially well-known functionality because they are doing exactly the same as a regular operating system. So they do resource management, they provide abstractions, but all of this is implemented on 
well, depending on which way you view it, on a higher layer for uh, orchestration, but also on a lower layer for the hypervisor technology. Below it and the operating system you virtualize lives somewhere in the middle. So that's all for today. Here's some literature references about especially virtualization support, uh, what you can do without direct execution or interpretation or jitting, and uh, finally, I think we've had this before, the formal requirements that a CPU needs to be fulfilled to be virtualizable in hardware. That's all for today. I hope you found this interesting and especially if you use cloud services, now you have a bit of a better background of what's actually going on. So thanks for listening and until next time. Bye.